Welcome to the webinar from Babel to Books, Fostering Early Language for Later Literacy Success with Dr. Lakeisha Johnson. Let's give uh, folks a few minutes to hop on the web to the web webinar before we begin. Those of you who have already uh, joined, you may want to put your names and where you're from in the chat box for Dr. Johnson to see. Again, welcome to our webinar series, Spotlight on Structured Literacy. My name is Lama Faran, and I serve on the IDA Georgia Board of Directors. On behalf of the boards of both IDA and the Reading League Georgia, we are pleased to be offering this webinar series for the third year. IDA and the Reading League are committed to providing information on evidence-based practices to educators, parents, and advocates. In doing so, we hope all students will have access to structural literacy instruction. In this four-part series, our speakers draw on the science of reading and the science of instruction to inform us on how to most effectively instruct literacy and what content to include to ensure students become competent readers and writers. In our first webinar in the series, Aligning State Literacy Policies and Practices, we learned about the efforts in Georgia to, meet, to move policy to practice to, to improve literacy outcomes for all our students. In our second webinar, Dr. Kimiona Burke spoke about lessons learned from Mississippi's journey to improving literacy for all students. In our third webinar, Dr. Nadine Gab addressed screening for literacy milestones in reading disabilities, including developmental dyslexia in early elementary grades. In tonight's webinar, Dr. Lakeisha Johnson will discuss how early language skills and later literacy are intricately connected. She will explore how oral language serves as a crucial building block that paves the way to reading success. Dr. Johnson will also share strategies and activities to help foster a language rich environment. Before we begin, thank you to those who submitted questions when you register for, for this webinar. As a reminder, uh, if you have other questions, please put them in the chat box. The chat will be monitored this evening by Elizabeth Hogan, president of the Reading League Georgia. During the Q&A, our speaker will address as many of your questions as time allows. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Lakeisha Johnson is an assistant professor in the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Florida State University and an ASHA certified speech language pathologist. She is also the director of the Village, the Community Outreach and Engagement Division of the Florida Center for Reading Research. 
She received her doctorate in communication sciences and disorders with an emphasis on literacy implications for culturally and linguistically diverse populations from Florida State University in 2012. Dr. Johnson previously served as a research scientist at Georgia State University in the Urban Child Study Center, where she oversaw several projects related to evaluating and improving language and literacy skills in urban early childhood settings and as an assistant professor at the University of the District of Columbia. Dr. Johnson's primary research interests include language, literacy, dialect, and exec executive function development in African-American children and other at-risk populations. It is her mission to investigate the aforementioned areas while building and strengthening research to practice partnerships between the university and the local community to ensure children from vulnerable and underserved populations obtain strong language and literacy skills. Her current work involves providing professional development for librarians to increase their use of evidence-based practices during story time sessions and youth programming. Additionally, Dr. Johnson runs a website, Mary's Book Nook, to promote language and literacy skills using diverse children's books. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lakeisha Johnson. Thank you so much, Lama, for that warm introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Um, I, as she mentioned, I used to live in Georgia for several years working at Georgia State University, so it's always nice to talk to uh, those from Georgia who support the Georgia IDA, as well as all of our friends who are from other places that you put in the chat. Um, I've also dropped a link to the slides from tonight, so feel free to click that link. You'll be able to download the PDF. So uh, as she mentioned, the title of this talk is From Babel to Books. And I really wanted to drive home the importance of why the early years matter. So we'll start just by going over what happens in the first few years of life um, and the connections for why they are the building blocks for later literacy skills. Um, we'll talk about some shared reading practice. I'll share some models of implementation that we're doing here in Tallahassee, Florida at the Florida Center for Reading Research. Um, and then I will also share some resources for you. I've included lots and lots of resources because we only have an hour together and there's so much I wanted to share, but I know I would not have time for it all. So we're gonna kick off with the early years. Uh, in the first five years of life, we know that the brain is developing rapidly and we know that it is happening extremely fast in the first two years of life. Um, the brain is triple the size of, the, of its weight at birth by the time the baby turns two. About 75% of the brain is developed by two years and 90%, as I mentioned, by five years. So infants and toddlers have thousands of new synapses forming in their brain every second. So it's important that we do as much as we can as caregivers and educators to ensure we're setting them up for success when it comes to learning language and then later literacy. So while we think about uh, genetics and genes and um, the experiences that are happening in a child's life, we know that genes determine the basic wiring of some of these experiences, um, or excuse me, genes determine the basic wiring of the brain. The experiences that the child has really helps to determine the actual pathways. And so the neurons that are firing in the brain, they make these synapses, which um, are increasing by 50 fold. And every single time you do something with a child to um, you know, make that connection strengthen, it's uh, helping to improve and grow their language skills. So every time you mention that word again, every time you uh, label an item, every time you read a book together, every time you use that second language, all of these things are really helping, helping to strengthen pathways. We know that language is a really complex process, right? Um, it's performed by many different interconnected areas in the brain and not just a single area. So in those first few years of life, I find it really, really fascinating. Um, and I have a seven month, uh, excuse me, I have a nine month old at home. Time is flying by that fast where 
Um, I can barely keep, keep up. But when I think about what happens in these first few months of life, um, in terms of speech and communication, it really is amazing. So children spend much of the first year losing their ability to perceive some of the contrasts that are not used in the speech around them. When they're born, they can discriminate between different sound durations, loudness levels, and even pitch. So that's the reason why the baby may turn their head um, when they hear uh, dad's voice versus mom's voice. They can discriminate between the two. They can tell the differences. Um, at seven months, infants are able to discriminate different words that they hear. And uh, it's really, really fascinating when you think about how newborns can technically detect every phoneme that's used in human languages. Adults, however, can't do that as easily. Think about if you're trying to learn a new language. I know um, I spent some time a few years ago trying to get on Duolingo to increase my Spanish um, fluency. And it's challenging, right? But newborns and young children have a lot more neuroplasticity in the brain. That's that ability um, for, to, to learn new things and for the brain to be more malleable. So newborns can detect virtually every phoneme. But what happens is because of the language and the, um, the sounds and the languages that they hear around them, that ability to discriminate other sounds starts to decrease. We also know that by about five months, infants are going to start responding to their own names. When it comes to the motor development and what's happening in terms of sounds, I know it, you're hard pressed to find a person who doesn't smile when they hear the sound of a baby babble or coo, right? So in terms of motor development and sound making, newborns primarily produce a lot of reflexive sounds. So of course, you know, um, they have some whining, some crying, um, some fussing, but then they also have those vegetative sounds um, that aren't controlled, like burping, swallowing that we hear. But then we hear that magical sound by about two months, infants start to goo and coo, um, where they have different vowel sounds like ooh, uh, and ah. Um, and then by two months, we start to also add in some of those back consonants, like those you see here on the screen as well as um, middle and back vowels. We also know that even children or infants with hearing impairments babble. So it's really important um, that we think and, and take advantage of all of the things that are happening when they're babbling, you're repeating some of the sounds that they make because over time, um, that babbling gets even more, um, it gets even more expressive and more complex and it starts to shift. So by three months, uh, it starts to sound a little bit more syllable-like. By four months, you'll hear some of baby's first true laughter. Um, and as they get even older, you'll see more consonants start to get added to that babbling. Um, and we'll move from reduplicated babbling, where it's the same consonant sound like ba 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 ba, to more um, where it is different patterns of babbling, where you may hear other vowel sounds being put together, vowels and consonants being put together. So uh, I'm going to show you a few different videos. Uh, this is my oldest daughter, who is now eight years old. But um, these are a few videos where you can kind of hear the difference uh, and think about this early speech and communication. Uh, we know that by five months, they're going to have some of those CV, consonant vowel syllable vocalizations, that start to re replace some of that previous sound making that they were doing. Um, babbling has a social element. And uh, babies are able to vary their volume, their pitch, and even their rate to attract the attention of the adults and uh, other people who are around them. It's really cool because it often sounds a lot just like sound play. <laughs> so this is at about four months old. We're starting to hear some of that laughter. You hear a little bit of sound play. And a whole lot of room, right? As we get a little bit older, we'll also start uh, by about six months, we'll have some labial sounds. That's when we're putting those lips together. So, start to dominate. That's even when we see babies start to blow raspberries. Here's an example. Uh -huh. 
where I'm trying to get her to say mama, to imitate. Mama. 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 So we've got some labial sounds, and then we know it's going to move into their blowing raspberries, reduplicated babbling, where it's the string of those CV repetitions. Um, and then we move finally into variegated bab babbling, where the syllables are not identical. So that could contain uh, different structures. So it could be CV, VCV, or CVC syllable shapes. So in these last two, um, we are about nine months and then um, about a year old. Where's the baby? Where's the baby? <laughs> Where's the baby? <laughs> you can hear some response some back and forth, some conversational terms already, even before real words have begun. And this is one of my favorites uh, because at, even at this age, babies communicate with you to know, let you know exactly how they're feeling. <laughs> Anyone in the chat want to tell me what you think she's trying to communicate to me as I tap my fingers on the headboard? Oh yeah, uh, so she was definitely ready for me to stop. Absolutely, she was over it. You could tell from the facial expressions uh, and the pushing, um, she was pushing my hand away, essentially. She was over me making the sound. So babies, even at that young age, can communicate with uh, their uh, families. And so when we think about language, there are five language domains that you probably are already familiar with. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but those five domains are phonology, which of course is the study of sounds and phonemes. So it's our speech sound system and how phonemes can be used and put together. Um, morphology, of course, is the rules on how morphemes are used. Yeah, and definitely for those commenting on the video, she definitely wanted to do it herself. And you're absolutely right. We are hardwired for communication. There wasn't necessarily anything other than just being in a language rich environment. She was learning the language, learning the um, social skills, like these pragmatics, how language is used in social situations, just based on the environment that she's been in. Um, syntax is rules on how sentences can be, or how words can be combined to form sentences, so which word combinations are grammatically acceptable in a language or in a dialect system, um, and of course semantics is the meaning of words and word combinations. By about age five, a child uses most sentence types, many different morphological markers like plurals, past tense, possessives, and um, they have acquired and can produce intelligibly most English phonemes. Uh, language form, um, it expands rapidly during the preschool years and each domain of language impacts the other. So what happens in terms of phonology and morphology can have a huge impact on syntax as well as semantics. So Snow in 2020 uh, created this graphic that I absolutely love because it really drives home the fact that early oral language exposure is the foundation for academic achievement overall. So when we think about what happens in those first five years of life, and even before the first five years, in the first three years, we know that so much of that baby's brain is being developed. It's important that we provide really rich um, really rich examples of language, uh, and we're going to do that in several ways. It could be through the language that they hear, it could be through books, it could be turn-taking conversations, toys, games, singing, all of these things then come later to have an impact on literacy skills like reading, writing, and spelling. So our brains are 
our, our brain um, is not wired for reading, right? It changes to accommodate reading. And so developmentally, language precedes reading and writing, but these sy systems then start to develop in parallel to one another. And so when a child has a strength in uh, language, it then builds off uh, or helps support later strengths in reading and vice versa. Um, reading is, is imposed on our brains, right? Um, and although we may be wired for language, we, our brains have to adapt and change in response to reading. Um, this, this, uh, graph, this graphic by Simos and colleagues from 2001, I love to use it because it really shows what's happening when uh, the brain doesn't change as expected and reading problems develop. So in child one, what you'll see is initially brain areas in the right hemisphere are activated during reading. Um, and so uh, then there's a shift. Um, once you become a uh, fluent or a successful reader, then uh, the right hemisphere disengages and the left hemisphere lights up a whole lot more and there's a lot more activation there. Um, those areas disengage but we see the opposite pattern in children who have dyslexia. So they still have a lot of right here, right hemisphere activation. But we know that there are all sorts of things that we can do to help support um, our children who have dyslexia as well as children who have um, reading um, disorders and children who may be at risk. Families are our first defense, right? Um, it's the first context for language and literacy learning. And so children are listening constantly to all of the language that's around them. They are truly like those sponges. It is They will hear and do things that um, you don't even know that you've said yourself. Uh, for example, I am from South Carolina originally. I, um, of course, I speak English, I, but I speak several different dialects of English, mainstream American English or general American English as it's called. Um, but I also speak African American English. And I can hear even in my own child, um, sometimes when she makes certain shifts um, and it's like, did she hear me say that? Who said that around her? But it's, but language is, it's ingrained in us. And it's really, really cool when you start to see it happening um, as they get older. Children observe print that surrounds them, of course, and they watch what others are doing when it comes to reading and writing and how they use those skills in their daily life. And so the development of these skills really relies heavily on the literacy practices of the family. So early stages of reading development, of course, happen way before a child even gets to school. Um, they are gaining awareness of print as well as of sounds while gradually learning that there are associations between the two. So before they even know and they're able to identify that this letter makes this sound um, very early on in the activities and games that you play within the songs, the rhymes, you can help, make, help them gain more awareness. Reading development begins in a more social interaction between a baby and a caregiver, um, or as you see in the picture, an older sibling. Um, early on, book sharing is meant to be conversational. It is not about the words that are on the page. Um, the book serves as the focus of communication. So it's all about what conversations that we're having around the text that we're reading. Um, Reading the story may be secondary, and that's okay. A lot of the times when I'm working with families, um, you know, they say that their child doesn't sit long enough to hear a story. Um, and that's perfectly fine. You want them to lead the conversation. It's just a part, it's a, it's a tool or a prop at that age that can be used to just have really rich conversations. Caregivers can um, model responses for the child, of course, at this age, provide feedback and talk about the text as well as the pictures and even just what the child is doing. Are they turning the pages? Are they trying to taste the book, right? We know that with infants, um, they are learning and exploring through their senses. So strong relationships exist between the age in which home, home reading routines are established and later um, literacy skills. So when we think about emergent literacy, there are four major domains um, that are often discussed. And so the one that we're focusing on today, because of course, phonological awareness and um, phonics are is, is extremely important. 
um, being able to manipulate sounds, play with sounds, it's foundational for later reading, but we also know it's important to have alphabetic awareness, that alphabetic principle, being able to identify letters, letter sounds, the connections between the two, as well as print concept. But we're focusing a bit more just on oral language for this talk, just because we know that it provides so much of that foundation. And so um, when there's a high quality oral language environment fostered, uh, adults are frequently engaging in extended conversations. So they are expanding and extending the child's speech. They're introducing new vocabulary and providing opportunities for contingent responses. If there are any SLPs in the audience, you know that those, you know, hopefully I'm talking your language, right? Those are the things that we are constantly preaching in terms of ways to increase oral language skills. So a uh, fact for you, approximately uh, six percent of the day in preschool classrooms is spent in conversations that promote oral language. Only six percent. And that number is quite staggering when you think about the amount of time that children spend in classroom settings, right? Only about six percent of it um, is promoting oral language. But we know that there are things that we can do um, ways that we can train both educators, caregivers, early child care providers, practitioners, and even families um, to, to ensure that our language isn't just directives. So do this, do that, stop, no, um, come here, put that away. What are some of the other ways that we can um, start to use language skills for families uh, and for uh, caregivers? So one um, tool that I recommend uh, is actually a text that recently was published from um, one of my colleagues at FSU and the Florida Center for Reading Research um, by Trisha Zucker and Sonia Cavill um, is the Strive for Five framework. And so Strive for Five is not a new concept or a new term. Um, Dickinson back uh, many years ago from Vanderbilt kind of coined the term but they were able to use and build on um, the, the, the framework to really think about how teachers can use this strive for five technique um, in classroom settings. Uh, but it, it isn't only for teachers. This can also be impactful uh, for the families that you may be working with, or if you are a, a parent yourself and you wanna, you wanna figure out what can I do more of? Because I know for me, um, even as an SLP by trade, um, I can pour out and do all the really, really rich language stuff at work all day when I'm at school with um, students and clients. But when I get home to read the book with my daughter, it's like, OK, let's get through this book as fast as I can. It's bedtime. You know, we're trying to keep to the schedule. So it's important to think about ways that we can all strive for five. And it's just this practice of moving towards at least five conversational turns between the adult and the child. Um, and so you wanna do things that have contingent responses. That just means um, the questions that I ask, um, it's to ensure that they have an opportunity to respond back and it's, uh, it doesn't stop there. So the teacher asks a question, the student responds correctly um, or, uh, then you get to scaffold up or down, depending on how they respond. The student responds again, and then the teacher expands on what the, the child said. So we want to be able to have those conversational terms. So when we think about the connections between early language skills and what that means for reading, in all of the reading theories that you may be, uh, the two that you may be most familiar with are the simple view of reading and Scarborough's reading rope. And you'll notice that in both of them, it's not just decoding or word recognition or phonics, right? There is this other area, listening comprehension, that's really, really important and impactful in both. And that, that's truly those oral language skills that I've been talking about. Background knowledge, vocab, understanding the structure of language like um, syntax and semantics and even being able to have some verbal reasoning and um, that print knowledge. So all of these things are really impactful for later reading success. We know that there are links, of course, between what happens in these first few years in terms of oral language ability and reading comprehension. 
So about 60% of the variance in reading comprehension is explained by language skills in third grade. So a lot of the work and research that I do is related to African-American children who are dialect speakers um, and looking at um, the impact of dialect use on um, language skills. And very often you'll see that heavy dialect speakers have lower language or lower reading skills. Um, but I, I urge you to continue reading and doing the work in those areas because what we know is that dialects in and of itself, nor um, being bilingual causes a child to have, uh, is a direct cause for a child having a reading disability. Um, what we know is that 60% of the variance is explained by language skills. So one of the things that I like to um, I like to think and, and focus on are, of course, read alouds, but there are so many other ways in terms of the daily interactions that we have with children, our daily routines, diapering, feeding, bath time, uh, nighttime routines, um, when we go to the park, our car rides, grocery store runs. All of these are really, really important aspects of um, of growing and deepening oral language skills because it then leads to later reading comprehension. So when we think about the foundational skills that are important for how kids learn how to read once they do enter school, you'll see in these um, in the recommendations from the IES practice guide on how to support reading in uh, kindergarten through third grade. Um, that the fourth one I've highlighted here is ensuring they're reading connected texts. So we have to have some opportunities for reading in connected texts to be able to then connect to comprehension. And all of the things that are um, the sources for all of these things are linked here for you to be able to easily go back to them through the PDF. When we think about shared reading practices, um, I am a huge advocate of shared reading simply because it's been proven to be effective um, in all children. That's children with disabilities, children um, who are bilingual, children who are at risk for reading impairments, um, children who may be at risk for developmental language um, disorders. So it works for everyone. It works for typically developing children. It is one of the best ways to encourage oral language skills um, and books often uh, contain, of course, many words that children don't hear in conversation or in television. So it's helping to increase vocabulary and background knowledge. And as I mentioned, there's that relationship between those oral language skills and, um, and later reading. So when it comes to, um, when it comes to what strategies we can use, we read books very differently with an infant versus a preschooler, right? Um, and it's so important that we think about the language of the home, yes, and the language of the school, um, and that we show value to both. Um, we don't want to diminish any of the things. Um, it's my, I always say it's my role as an SOP, as a professor, a researcher, to just add more tools to your toolbox. Um, but all of, the, all of our language systems, our dialect systems are valuable, and we want to encourage parents to do all of the things. So to continue using those dialects, continue using their um, native language, um, because it's strengthening skills in both. So it's really important. When we think about infants, um, we want to follow their interests and needs, right? So as I mentioned, they, they're going to use their senses to explore the book. They may be more interested in the physical part. That could be chewing the corner, dropping it to see what happens. Destructible books are our favorite because they are, or indestructible books because uh, they don't know how books work quite yet, right? They're more interested in just what the page can do versus actually finishing the book. And so um, we can do things like uh, encouraging engagement through still talking, asking questions and pausing, talking about what's happening. But also um, we've tried things like where you make a little map. I've taken, taken books and just kind of put them on the floor, let her crawl around as she's crawling to the book or to certain um, pictures. Then that's what we talk about when she hits that picture. So you can make it as engaging as possible for infants. For toddlers at around age two, they start to show more interest in just sitting for stories. Um, but we still want to allow them to lead. 
uh, repeat the things they say, but then also expand by offering new words and vocabulary and adding information. Um, because all, uh, for some of you who are here there in Georgia, you probably already know about all of the wonderful resources from Cox Campus and the Rollins Center at the Atlanta Speech School. The talk strategy is one of my favorites. There are a wealth of resources there. Talk is an acronym for tuning in, asking questions, lifting language through modeling and keeping it going. Strategies for toddlers and preschoolers. As they progress, of course, in emergent literacy skills, we wanna do things like focus and hone in on books with repeated phrases, reading the same book over and over. I know so many times um, I talk with families or even myself as a parent, you get tired of reading the same book over and over and over and over and over. But we have to because every time you read that book, those neural pathways that I mentioned are deepening. They're learning new words. They're learning uh, inflection and intonation. Every time you read, you can read with a different purpose. So you want to discuss what's happening in the illustrations and ask questions, make connections to their lives, as well as uh, thinking about and making sure you're providing enough wait time. Toddlers and preschoolers have a lot happening in those little brains as they're developing, and uh, their cognitive capacity is stretched. So you want to make sure that you're providing enough wait time, and especially as kids start to learn letters and letter sounds. Um, if they're spending a lot of time trying to decode um, as they get a little bit older, then they may not have as much cognitive capacity left over for some of the comprehension kinds of things. So you want to make sure you're providing enough wait time. Um, and of course, when it comes to um, when it comes to children with disabilities. Um, we know that they, even if they are engaging with books in a different manner, um, we should still uh, have goals and aspirations for our kids with disabilities to learn how to read. Um, research has shown that approximately 95% of people can learn to read with, nine, with direct and systematic evidence-aligned instruction and extra support as it's needed. And so with that explicit and systematic instruction, um, we know that there are things that we can do, modifications as well as accommodations that can really help to promote uh, active engagement with books and children with disabilities. So um, selecting books, of course, um, that are appropriate de developmentally, um, uh, positioning, so ensuring that they are seated in a position that may help if there are physical impairments, um, if there are fine motor, um, challenges, you know, uh, using page turners, adding popsicle sticks to books to be able to uh, change the pages, using low-tech assistive devices. Um, there are all kinds of strategies that we can use to ensure that um, even children with disabilities can, can um, participate in shared book reading. So I've talked a bit about books. And we know that access is important because so often a lot of times what we see happen is people are very quick to throw, let's just give them more books. More books is good, but it's only one part of the solution, right? We have to know what to do with said book. So reading the text is, is, is necessary, right? It's um, reading the text that's on the page is necessary, but it's also uh, an insufficient strategy when we want to get our, our, our biggest bang for our buck when it comes to how books can help to support oral language. So our interactions can occur um, before reading, during reading, and after reading. And there can even be uh, interactions that are related to um, the, the meaning of the book. So um, vocabulary and um, vocabulary, the content, the, the meaning of the story, asking questions, and then print related kinds of things. That's the uh, actual letters and sounds, um, looking at if there are words in the book that may be highlighted or large or in different font. Um, print concepts like the reading from left to right, top to bottom, turning the page, right? All of those things are really important skills. So dialogic reading is my one of my favorite strategies um, because it is it's interactive um, and it has 
um, through Whitehurst and colleagues have documented that it has positive effects on not just oral language, but as well as print knowledge and emergent reading and writing. So within dialogic reading, um, we can, we have two strategies that are, uh, that I pulled out from Whitehurst. The peer sequence, which is really a way for you just to remember that you want to prompt and then expand what the child has said. So ask the question, let them respond, and then expand on it even more. The crowd strategy I love, and this example, um, the crowd strategy is from um, Whitehurst, but this example in particular is from the Iowa Reading Research Center um, with the, um, the Three Little Pigs. I had a just, I couldn't remember the name of the story. The Three Little Pigs. When we think about asking questions, sometimes we ask the same types of questions when we're reading books. And so the crowd strategy is really impactful because it just helps you remember of a different variety of questions to ask. And when I'm training and coaching, sometimes that means we're actually taking little post-its and writing out our questions. We have completion questions, um, recall questions. And you can see even in the hierarchy of some of these questions being a little bit more um, a little bit more um, challenging versus others, like distancing questions may be a little bit more challenging, whereas a completion question may be easier, maybe more explicit. So it's important to have a variety of question types. When we think about how we can target all those things, so remember I showed you the, the five different language domains. These domains are directly related to the skills that are impactful for reading. And through books, you can target all of those areas. So you'll see here, um, when thinking about semantics, we're gonna use books for vocabulary diversity, uh, in morphology, increasing the mean length of that utterance or phrase that they're able to say, and so forth. Pragmatic, syntax. We can use books for all of these things, um, and so it's really helpful to think about how we use our read alouds and our time. Um, and sometimes it may be not just even in, um, not just with really, really young kids, but read alouds are also important when we have kids who are independent readers. It's still important to do those oral read alouds because you can then get into some of these more um, verbal reasoning, um, implicit questions and higher order critical, critical thinking skills. For our youngest kids, however, um, you can target so many skills. I have just, I mean, this was just me naming six or seven, right? But I could go on and on about all of the different skills and concepts that could be used to target or that could be used um, to really hone in on language through books. And so um, rhyming, of course, expanding phrases, story grammar con uh, concepts, basic concepts like our spatial concepts in, out, on, under, beyond, behind. You can go as far as you can when it comes to books. And so when you're thinking about it though, um, and this is for both um, caregivers as well as educators and practitioners, um, every book is not a good book for a teaching moment, right? There's some books that are just cute. But then when we're thinking about, we wanna actually uh, teach a new set of skills, um, I like to use this acronym MUST. Um, I call it my must-haves when choosing a book. So um, I worked in a Title I school where over 90% of the kids I served were African-American or Latino. So it was imperative that I use books that featured diverse characters. I wanted the kids that I worked with to, to see themselves reflected in everything we did in our therapy sessions. So the M is for multicultural and diverse characters. The U, unique vocabulary and sophisticated language. So thinking back to those, that big five when it comes to language, um, vocab, we wanna make sure that we're introducing new vocabulary that may be unfamiliar. We want some story grammar comp, uh, components. We want the story to have some meat, right? So that we're able to actually have a good discussion. And then um, 10 minutes or less. Even for our older kids, we want to ensure that if we spend too long reading the book, then we don't get to do the extension activities that could go along with it. 
So um, I say 10 minutes or less, and you can read that same book several times where each time you read it, you have a different goal. The first time may be the introduction and connecting, making connections to background knowledge. The next time it might be vocabulary. The next time it might be um, extending it beyond the text that was actually on the page. So when thinking about the, the way that we do all of these things, what are we doing in the work that I am responsible for? So uh, I'm the director of the village, as I mentioned at Florida, uh, at the Florida Center for Reading Research, which is the Community Engagement and Outreach Division. And so we really wanna support and create research practice partnerships in our local community. Um, it's not enough for us to just kind of have all of these connections to reading theory and what and be contributing to um, what the, the country and the world knows about how kids learn how to best read. We wanna ensure that we're making an impact in our local community. So we work really specifically with local partners to ensure we are moving the needle in our own backyard. There are a number of resources on the FCRR pages. All of these images are hyperlinked um, where we have student center activities that are divided by grade level from pre-K up until grades five by grade level and then by skill domain area. So you can find um, pre-K activities kindergarten, first grade, second grade through fifth grade. And then for those who are in Florida, we've also added them where they are aligned to the best standards, where you can select a standard and then find the actual activities that go along with that standard. We've even created videos of families actually doing these activities so that you can see models in our every school, in our community, um, in our district has these um, kiosks where we stop all kinds of materials for parents and caregivers around um, early, early reading, emergent literacy, and things that they can do at home and how they can support. For those of you who um, may be practitioners yourself, we have a newly launched academy that features short courses for not only teachers and literacy coaches, but also school leaders and families. Um, my baby that I've been spending a lot of my time with is um, Book Nook Bundles. Uh, the research that I'm currently doing involves um, working with youth service librarians. You know, I, I like to think about who are the partners, community partners outside of families and teachers who have an impact in how kids learn how to read. And so one of the community partners that I wanted to tap into was librarians because there are families who come there. Um, it's a library is one of the only free places you can still go, right? Um, so in all of our library systems, you will see these amazing book nook bundles where there are 25 different titles. All of the information is provided here on this website as well, just so you can, people can access it who aren't here, but families can check out these bundles to be able to, um, explore a diverse children's book. Um, it also, I'll show you just a little clip of them. It's a diverse book, a manipulative um, tab, a, a storybook guide that I'll show you a little bit more of, where we really just want to show families that these are things that you can do at home. Um, and they're available in all of our libraries across our, our, our city for absolutely for free. Um, I create these beyond the book guides, which are also freely available. There are tons of them that are specific to books. When we think about oral language skills, we want to think about what's happening before you read the book, the vocab that you choose, as well as during the story and after the story. Um, I've even laid out questions that you can ask when you read the story. So all of these materials are absolutely free. And I do this because I think it's, it's impactful to be able to, one, share it in your classrooms, but also then to share it with families. And we started to use these in our research as well. My book nook features a ton of resources. Um, and there are, like I said, there are a lot of guides here. So there are a ton of them and the PDFs are there and they're freely available. Um, there are a lot of resources on just how do we use uh, language, language uh, literacy skills, um, and how do we promote them through books. So 
I know I wanna make sure I have enough time to answer your question. We know that as many as 70% of children with oral language impairments will later exhibit written language and reading impairments. And so a child's academic success can be determined um, by what's happening when they're infants and toddlers and in that preschool language development phases. And so storybook reading has been proven to be an effective method for so many kids, um, including those who have identified language disorders and those who are at risk. Uh, I like to talk about this with um, the use through the use of diverse books because we want to provide an authentic lens for all kids to see themselves. And we know that when they do see themselves, they're more motivated to continue engaging with the text. There are a ton of additional resources that are listed on the final slides that you are free to look through. Um, I tried to include as much as I could, including some of our great things from um, Atlanta Speech School and the Cox Campus materials because they are absolutely amazing. And so with that, I would love to answer a few of your questions in our final, final minutes together. How was that, Elizabeth? You did awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. That was amazing. I almost forgot to come on to do the Q&A because I was writing down all the resources. Um, <laughs> well, I look, I, I put the slides. I put the, you have access to the slides, so you don't yeah. have to write everything down. I know. I know. It's just the way my brain works. But I was thinking it's so cool to um, know about your Beyond the Book bundles um, and guides because those... Yes. I know for those of us that are in schools and in school districts, we have a lot of corporations and people that want to come in and volunteer their time, but they don't know what else to do besides just read the book. And this is something that we could just, you know, hand to someone. And it looks like it would be easy enough for a volunteer to follow. Absolutely. And we we've used them in so many different ways because you're right. Like you can literally give this to a person we've done. Um, um, different books by different age bands. So there's everything from board books up to um, books for uh, four to eight. So about third grade. So mostly picture books. I'm tinkering the idea of going into some middle grade novels because my own daughter is getting a little bit older, but it's a perfect way to, uh, to, to turn this over to uh, a, a volunteer um, mm -hmm. to give it to a parent when you're thinking about summer reading or how to keep kids reading over the summer. Um, these bundles are, there are 25 titles, like I mentioned, they're divided here by zero to four and then um, four to eight, and you'll even see the category um, or the theme for them. So uh, it was a, a labor of love pulling these together. Well, it's really, really cool. I, I, I'm so excited to um, know about this. So, um, all right, well, let's get to some questions. <laughs> um, I jumped right in with my enthusiasm about <laughs> um, what I just learned, but um, we did have a couple of questions. Um, so I know that a lot of us on this webinar are teachers, and oftentimes we are getting kids in pre-K and kindergarten and first grade who haven't had this great um, background, mm -hmm. um, oral language background. And so what do you think are the key things that actual classroom teachers can do to kind of backfill for these kids that we are recognizing, you know, that they're coming in at a big mm -hmm. deficit? Yeah. Um, and well, two things. One, I say definitely partner and collaborate with your SLP. Um, the SLP in your building is there because they have language expertise. When people ask me why do SLPs feel like we, we can um, be, you know, uh, involved in kids learning to read, it's because language is foundational to learning how to read. And so utilizing SLPs, I think, is a very impactful way that teachers can help, of course, um, where you could collaborate and do some things together. But for the day-to-day, -day, uh, it's all about the language uh, environment that you set up. So um, encouraging all of the things that I've mentioned in terms of those oral language skills in the big five areas of language. So thinking about um, phonology and semantics, we want to increase um, or uh, increase exposure because all kids are coming to school with something. And I think we as educators have to and practitioners have to change our, our, our frame of reference that what they're coming to school with is, is at deficit, but that they're coming to school with something different. 
right? They have really, really rich experiences. They just might not be the same as yours. So how do you provide them with some additional experiences, um, but also show value to what they are coming with? So if they are excellent storytellers, like in African-American English, it's an oral dialect, they may be a really, really great storyteller, but you might not get that good of a written narrative, right? How are you going to use what they're coming with to then leverage on to some of the other skills you want to teach? So in classroom settings, it's so much about um, just continuing to build those skills. And I think um, I have a colleague who said it best. Sometimes as educators and practitioners, we like to think about um, the treatment before we teach. So we have to teach before we treat. So sometimes we automatically think about this, this from this deficit perspective. We got to do all this stuff to get them there. Um, when really it's just what are we going to provide that would be a high quality language environment? So we're talking a lot. We're having rich conversations. Um, there's the strive for five, those back and forths that um, you're doing together. All of those things can make a huge impact. And of course, bring in all the books, do all the things with that. I always start with books because books are an easy way to really get as big of a bang for your buck. And then you can take that same text and plan the rest of your day, even in other areas, in math, in science, you know, in STEM related kinds of things, and still make connections back, which is only just going to deepen the language parts. Wow. I love that. I love thinking about, you're right. It's not a deficit. It's a difference and mm -hmm. leveraging the strengths to then build up any maybe perceived weakness. So right. I, I love right. the thinking about it that way. Thank you. Um, so another question um, that uh, someone asked is probably from a parent perspective is thinking back to like the infant stage or toddler stage, when should parents start to worry or seek intervention for what they think might be a delay? Yeah. So um, there are a lot of resources that are available. Um, of course, you can refer to the CDC milestones. So the Center for Disease and Control, they have developmental milestones that are broken down really, really well that um, parents can look at. And there are checklists that are there where you can see, is your child meeting those milestones? As soon as you start to have any concerns, I'll bring them up with your pediatrician. We like to see babies, of course, they usually start with their first word by about the age of one, somewhere around the first birthday, first words by about age two, they're putting two words together. And so um, when we, when you start to have concern, I say bring it up immediately. Um, when we, and there are resources like from the CDC's milestones, the American Speech Language and Hearing Association has a, um, a language section that has some different checklists as well that I always recommend you can go print it out and then say, these are the areas of concern that I'm having. There's also child behavior, um, oh, what is the acronym? Child Behavior Development Checklist for top infants and toddlers. We use that in developmental screenings that we do in the community for free. Um, and you can, I, I always tell people, do this screening, print it out or do it on your phone. And then when you go to your pediatrician, you can say, these are all of the areas where I maybe feel like my child isn't reaching some of those milestones. Another good, um, one other resource is um, First Words. Um, it's Dr. Amy Weatherby. Um, it's the First Words Project, and they have a ton of information um, about language, language delays, as well as autism. I'm trying to drop some of the things in the chat in case uh, Kim and all of you amazing folks at IDA and TRO want to add some of these additional resources. Yes, yeah, so many good resources tonight. Um, I was thinking a lot of us um, who are in this land of structured literacy, I so much of this was new information to me about the shared reading, the peer um, and the and the crowd. Yes. That is such great information. So I really appreciate you sharing that with us because it is something that even though I'm doing this work every day that I haven't really thought about as much or I'm mm -hmm. not impressing upon teachers um, that we're training as much. So I, I right. really appreciate that. And you can absolutely, you know, um, when you're when you're 
early on in thinking about reading in this way, I like to say that, you know, what we're doing is having a language-based approach to teaching kids how to read. And so these things work even, it, it's it's just, it's good for any kid. It's not just our kid who is uh, at risk or our kid who has a disability. All kids can benefit from thinking about how we learn how to read in this way from a more language-centered approach. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Johnson. This was amazing. Again, I'm I'm kind of thrown off from trying to take it all in, but um, it was well, that's amazing. a good sign. That's yes, a good sign. it's a great sign. I'm excited. I'm probably going to be up half the night deep diving into all your resources, and you're so generous to share them all with you, with us, and our registrants and the slides. Um, so thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. If you have any colleagues who missed tonight's webinar, let them know that all the registrants, registrants will be receiving a link to the webinar, as well as the slides to this presentation. Um, also, all registrants will have the opportunity to fill out a knowledge check or, or, and a request for a certificate of attendance. So after you've viewed the webinar, either live or recorded, um, the form will be sent early next week and registrants will have an approximately one week to submit the form. So those who fill out the form will receive their certificate of attendance the next day. On behalf of the IDA Georgia Board and the Reading League Georgia Board, we appreciate you attending our webinar this evening and the whole series we've had this winter. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of the evening and we look forward to seeing you at the annual IDA conference in September on the campus of Georgia College and State University. Thanks everyone for attending and especially thanks to you, Dr. Johnson and everyone have a good night. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good night.